graph and all, I know this is a post lunch session after a possibly heavy lunch. So I'm going to keep it uh, as light as possible. Um, my name is Parasaran Raman. I uh, am a senior data scientist at Eastwind Networks. We are a small uh, cybersecurity startup uh, here in the valley. Uh, we do a lot of breach analytics and uh, uh, provide visibility uh, to our, uh, our customers. We gather a lot of uh, threat intelligence, both from a variety of sources and uh, as well as you know, in-house uh, develop uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, the topic for today is uh, on-demand uh, outlier detection, and um, you know people talk about outlier detection in the, in, in the in the field of security uh, every day. People trash them. People like them. Um, what we want to do here is to uh, see what machine learning can provide towards uh, picking out points that are anomalous, that are different, that are uh, deviant in your in your network. And um, so we recently got a technology acceleration uh, program grant from Ustar uh, that funds this uh, project. The, the problem here is to detect and predict possible user and um, machine malicious activity. Uh, the solutions that we take uh, are, are uh, multifold, uh, the primary of which is to see if we can explore uh, lower dimensional facets and subspaces of data uh, with the help of deep learning algorithms and other uh, supervised uh, machine learning algorithms uh, in a fashion that is on demand. Uh, and when I, when I say on demand, what I mean is you have a lot of uh, threat sources, threat intelligence that tells you uh, that there are uh, data points that are malicious, that are suspicious, and you want to be able to help the analyst go from there and track other data points that are similarly malicious, uh, possibly, you know, possible lateral movement across your uh, network, and you want to be able to help the analyst uh, picking out these other points that look similar, similarly malicious, similarly suspicious uh, in your, you know, hundreds of millions of data points that flow across your, uh, you know, customer's network and your network. Um, outliers in general are very ill-defined. Uh, People uh, find it very hard to define outliers, especially in the field of security. Uh, there is a lot of noise, especially because the data is in very high dimensions. Uh, this can be NetFlow data, SIM data, event logs, uh, endpoint data, files, you name it. Uh, any kind of security data is, one, heterogeneous, two, uh, in uh, ridiculously high dimensions, that there is a lot of noise when you look at the data and the meaning of outlier somehow gets lost in this, in this context. Uh, one of the more acceptable definitions that I've found uh, comes from Hawkins way back in the 80s. Uh, and uh, the definition goes, an outlier is an observation that deviates so much from other data that it almost feels like it was generated by a different mechanism. Uh, but to me, uh, I uh, love looking at um, data from a geometric perspective. perspective. And to me, uh, this uh, illustration is possibly a, a good example of what it means to be an outlier. So think of data in two dimensions. Uh, you have three cohesive clusters, black circles, uh, blue and red points. Then you have a bunch of Xs that are possibly outliers. If I were to cluster them, if I were to group them into cohesive groups, uh, this is one possible uh, reasonable clustering of the data, but this is a very uh, loose clustering. Each cluster is really wide and not very cohesive. There are points, there are Xs that are really far away, but they are included in the cluster uh, just because I have to include all the points. But if I were to remove the outliers or the Xs, I get much more cohesive and compact clusters. And to me, the definition of outlier is if you leave out these points, uh, which give you much better compact uh, partitions, uh, these were points which were outliers in the, uh, in the first place. So the, the problem somehow boils down to, can you find uh, needles in a haystack from, can you find the sharpest needles in a, in a stack of needles? 
So uh, Dave, in his uh, keynote address, uh, made three excellent points that resonated with uh, what we do. Uh, you know, one, uh, remove noise and focus on what matters. And I think uh, a lot of what we do uh, in our on-demand outlier detection uh, focuses precisely on this. Uh, we want to be able to remove a whole bunch of noise and help the analyst make decisions uh, much faster than he would have or she would have uh, in the first place. Uh, and I agree, and I think most of uh, the audience agrees that signature-based stuff is absolutely ridiculous these days. It's very hard to uh, keep uh, up with the with, with the uh, intrusions that happen in your network with signature-based uh, methods. Uh, and detection is generally hard, uh, and uh, we therefore want our uh, machine learning capability to be able to supplement the analyst, supplement the security analyst, um, assist the security analyst in uh, network a uh, analytics and forensics uh, instead of you know claiming that we can do real-time breach detection uh, just with machine learning. So uh, a quick uh, uh, definition of machine learning, it's a branch of engineering that develops technology for purposes of inference. Uh, it combines algorithms, statistics, and optimization for most people. And, uh, and for me, the critical component is uh, you know, the viewing this through a geometric lens. And someone told me that there's an ancient Chinese secret that says the success of all machine learning algorithms depend on how you present the data. And I think a lot of what happens is the, 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 the criticism and failure of uh, machine learning algorithms across different uh, domains, um, security in particular, happens because you don't present the data the right way. Um, and there is a lot of hype when it comes to uh, AI in general, more specifically uh, machine learning these days, uh, particularly because I think academia in, in specific uh, has done a really poor job of telling the story of what machine learning algorithms are capable of. And the industry has been equally uh, uh, faulty in trying to overhype or oversell uh, what they can do. Uh, Kurtika, for example, recently uh, advertised that they could reverse engineer a rat's brain and they have a deep neural network uh, that they uh, generated from it. Again, with no um, you know, uh, research publication, not even a white paper, somehow very hard to believe. Maybe in 10 years, but uh, things like this push people away from even considering uh, you know, seeking the help of machine learning algorithms. Or, uh, you know, the example of the Microsoft AI uh, bot on Twitter that went quickly rogue because it was fed with all kind of garbage uh, learning data from uh, people on Twitter who tried to abuse the uh, bot. Or this other uh, app, Gender EQ, which uh, it's a recent app that claims to use AI to uh, listen to conversations in a meeting room and, and, and set or, or, or trigger trigger an alarm when there is mansplaining going on in the room. And um, if you only listen to all the women in life, you would have known that you know people have been mansplaining for ages. And so the problems with AI have been uh, multifold. I think one of the problems is the term artificial intelligence itself. The, the problem comes from we think of AI as a replacement for human intelligence, and I think we are really far from that. Yet we have a variety of successful uh, machine learning uh, applications, from spam filters and uh, Deep Blue playing chess uh, in the 90s, to self-driving cars and uh, AlphaGo defeating uh, Go masters recently. So there is a lot. There is a lot of scope. There is a lot of um, scope for machine learning in, in security. If only we did not uh, view it with a negative eye. Um, and uh, more recently. Uh, a number of open source projects have made it really easy to uh, prototype and implement uh, really simple and, um, and effective machine learning algorithms. My favorite ones are uh, the MLlib, which is a part of the Apache Spark project, and uh, Deep Learning for J. So taking a step back, the critical components for me while running any machine learning algorithm, um, 
particularly for uh, security, is the ability to represent and compare. If you could not take your data and represent them properly, and if you did not have the ability to compare the right data points uh, the right way, then uh, you, know, you could use your uh, rad brain reverse engineered algorithm, but still uh, be very in ineffective. So uh, there's a lot of grunge work that goes on in, 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 um, uh, in machine learning. Uh, most of it is trying to uh, curate the data, trying to um, you know, normalize the data, trying to uh, take the, make the data look uh, nicer, make it look more, or take it to a space where you can uh, do comparisons on the data, do effective math on the data. And I'll briefly talk about what I mean by this. Um, so you want to be able to represent and compare, and similarity measures is a way that you can compare uh, different data points, and for the humans, you know, with images, for example, it's very easy for us to tell uh, whether or not two images are similar because we have multiple criterions based on which we examine uh, how similar two images are or, or data that we can visualize. But often, security data is very non-visualizable; it's heterogeneous, high dimensions. Um, so, coming up with the right similarity measure becomes a hard problem. Um, these are three popular similarity measures, uh, cosine similarity, Euclidean distance, and earth movers distance. Uh, cosine similarity, for example, uh, looks at the angle subtended between uh, vectors in high dimensions, and the larger the angle, the lower the similarity. And uh, earth movers distance, in particular, is uh, really interesting because it helps you compare uh, two different distributions um, so if, for example, uh, you have signature A as the mission activity for user A and signature B as mission activity for user B and you would like to compare them, um, and you have a histogram of the values of different attributes that you have, one way to compare them is to use the earth moves distance and what it does is it tries to think of these uh, two uh, signatures as two dirt piles and what it does is to try and make one dirt pile look like the other. So clear the dirt so that the first signature looks like the second, and the amount of uh, dirt moved is the distance between the two uh, signatures. So if there is less dirt to be moved, uh, the distance is small and the two signatures are similar. And then you can talk about how uh, similar was my activity to uh, another person's activity or my activity to uh, my baseline activity f that was measured a month ago, and so on. Um, and uh, a couple of really cool ways to represent your, da represent your, your data, especially because we have such uh, heterogeneous data in, in security, is uh, one, uh, using a bag of words, uh, which you can use a term frequency uh, model, or use a word to work, which is, uh, which is more recently been very successful in natural language uh, processing. Um, word to work is actually really cool because it, it, it somehow uh, captures similar uh, semantic meaning between words. Uh, so for example, uh, the distance between king and queen is very similar to the distance between man and, and a woman. So. Um, Right, so, but representations are in general, uh, you know, hard. Coming up with the right representation uh, assists the right comparison of data. Um, the comparison becomes a byproduct of the representation uh, that you build. Uh, Xbox, Kinet, for example, uh, it, they worked on the Kinet project for a long time, trying to uh, record videos and uh, sample from video images and trying to recognize uh, the person instead of the video while they did not have enough processing power on the hardware to do that. Uh, a simpler, much more simpler representation of taking a series of images uh, and having biomechanics assist uh, different sensors on the human body was a much effective way, uh, a, a much more simpler, but still effective way uh, for Xbox Kinect. Uh, image segmentation was not very successful for a long time. Uh, image classification uh, suffered as a, as a result of it uh, until the SIFT uh, vector to take an image and convert it into a uh, uh, pass it through a convolutional filter to get a SIFT vector came along. Uh, similar advancements in word to work in uh, natural language processing as well.
So uh, the takeaway here is that um, you want the right representations uh, for the data, uh, and, and, and I put this within quotes because it's very hard to know what the right representation for your data is. So there's a lot of grunge work, a lot of playing with the data to see if you really have the right representation for the data. And the ability to then compare the data correctly will uh, help your machine learning algorithms greatly. So uh, the the topic of the uh, the topic for today is again is uh, on demand outlier detection, and the way we do on demand on demand outlier detection is by looking at uh, subspaces of data. You have your data in very high dimensions, uh, possibly thousands of dimensions, but a lot of them could be uh, a lot of noise. So you want to be able to filter them out and come down to uh, a smaller set of dimensions where the data makes much more sense. So the noise that we clear is both on the side of uh, the number of dimensions that you have in the data and the data itself. And uh, you know, uh, to that uh, point, high dimensions are, are, are very weird. Uh, you, if, you, if you look at uh, even an eight-dimensional sphere, if you can imagine an eight-dimensional sphere, uh, eight-dimensional sphere is very spiky. Think of, a, uh, uh, of those uh, sponge balls with all the spikes on it. An uh, eight-dimensional sphere kind of looks like that, with very minimal mass in the center, with all the mass being concentrated uh, around the uh, corners. A quick illustration of this is if you imagine a ball, small ball uh, between those four balls on, on the uh, left side in two dimensions, and now if you think of that in three dimensions, uh, and four and so on, the size of the ball in the center grows exponentially uh, with, uh, with, the, with the dimensions. And uh, the problem with this is now there is very little mass in the, in the center and there is a lot of mass spread around the corners. And, um, you know, for example, if you uh, look at the mass of the, uh, the blue uh, ring, you'd expect that mass to be really low with respect to the white mass in the center. But in 100 dimensions, the volume of the shaded portion uh, is 99% of the whole volume. And while this is very unintuitive, in, in, un the problem with this is uh, this is what is called the curse of dimensionality, and the problem with this is you end up in uh, a, a place where every point starts looking at every every other point, and therefore outliers make very minimal sense in really high dimensions. Um, so one way to counter that is to be able to be smart about uh, picking your features. You have possibly thousands of features that you collect, and you want to be able to pick ones that really matter. So for example, uh, this is a data from uh, 20 news groups, which is a, a very standard benchmark machine learning data, which exists in 56 plus 1,000 dimensions. And uh, if you reduce it to 300 dimensions, on the, the chart on the left side shows the uh, pairwise distance between the points in the original space and the uh, reduced space, uh, things are pretty intact. You don't lose a lot of shape of the data while coming down to even 300 dimensions. But if you go down to, for example, 10,000 dimensions, which is a little higher than uh, what you want, uh, you have the data being preserved almost uh, entirely uh, perfectly. So uh, the, the other way to uh, look at uh, reducing dimensions is to explore uh, possible subspaces of data. And this is what uh, we do when we try to uh, build our outlier detection algorithms. Uh, one way to uh, look at interesting subspaces is to see how explainable an outlier is in that subspace. So imagine this green uh, star, if you can see it, um, as a possible outlier. And these are different uh, projections of data in different two-dimensional spaces uh, from an original high dimension. And uh, this, these are possibly useful subspaces because in this space, I can explain my uh, the star being an outlier because it's further removed from the other uh, cohesive points. Whereas these projections, uh, it becomes very hard to explain the star as an outlier because it's right in the smack in the middle of all the uh, other points. So uh, there are a variety of uh, outlier detection algorithms out there. Uh, one class SVM being the most popular uh, outlier detection algorithm. Uh, there are a number of uh, deep learning 
uh, algorithms that are uh, really popular right now, including the replicator neural networks. Uh, one problem, though, with uh, most deep learning algorithms is it's uh, ridiculously data hungry, which might not be a problem because we have the hardware uh, to uh, deal with it, and we have a lot of data and security. But the real problem comes from, you know, deep learning networks are, are a big black box, which are really hard to interpret. And one of the goals of our project is to be able to provide interpretable, explainable uh, machine learning results. So uh, the one we go with are subspace-based methods. Uh, I'll go over one such method very briefly. So uh, the algorithm itself is really simple. Uh, we, uh, we are pre the, the, the premise is that we are presented with uh, different query data that are possibly suspicious from a variety of threat intelligence sources or by the analysts themselves. And we, are, we want to be able to pick out similarly malicious data points. And um, we, uh, to this end, we generate a, a bunch of lower dimensional subspaces. We calculate what is called a contrast, where uh, the outlier is furthest removed from uh, the other uh, points, the, the query outlier. And we keep these high contrast subspaces. We throw away the other subspaces. Um, we add possibly additional dimensions uh, in a way to keep the, uh, the contrast high. And we repeat till this is possible. And we find, and, and then in this space that we pick, we find other data points that look similarly uh, outlierish uh, compared to the query points that you began with. Um, so, uh, and, and the premise of this comes from, you know, the, the often attackers masquerade their uh, vectors uh, to look uh, very, uh, look like the benign traffic, and the tell often is from one or few of the network attributes, and we want to be able to zero in on these uh, attributes that uh, give us the tell so we can find similar uh, malicious uh, points as well. And uh, so this is an example of uh, high contrast, you have uh, really cohesive points in the, in the, in this projected space. Um, this is an example of low contrast where the data is really spread out and you don't, you don't want to keep these uh, spread out uh, projected uh, data. So this briefly, how many minutes do I have? Okay. Um, so this chart kind of briefly, briefly goes over what we do. Um, we have data from our, uh, you know, from our sensor going to a cloud. It, this could be SIM data, this could be uh, data from files, data from uh, logs, but essentially you have data that you have, you have represented in a, in a way uh, that machine learning algorithms can, um, can take in. You have uh, possibly come up with a right um, um, similarity measure that enables you to compare the data that are right way. And then um, what we do is, we, we do the subspace, subspace projection, we uh, arrive at the right subspace where uh, the tell is pronounced. Uh, we find other uh, outliers in this, in this space where the outliers are similar to the uh, original uh, point in the first place, and therefore the on-demand aspect of it. You, you, you want to find the subspaces and the outlier on-demand starting with uh, um, suspicious points that are picked out by the analyst or other threat intelligence sources. Um, and then visualize. So I think a lot of problem with machine learning comes from the ability to not explain the results of machine learning. And uh, our hope is that with our uh, visualization mechanisms, uh, we'll be able to tell the right story, include the user in the feedback mechanism, uh, and continuously improve uh, this uh, process that we have. Can I skip over this? Um, so there's still a lot of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, and, and, and a variety of them are, are, are really hard. The primary challenge that uh, we have, and I think a lot of people in security have, is to be able to get curated label data. Um, while the, uh, th there are possible benchmark attacks uh, that are publicly available, uh, and you could pick a, a, a number of examples from your own network or your customer's network um, of uh, malicious activity, Every malicious activity looks possibly different from other malicious activity, and uh, to be able to get a good representation uh, of uh, all the, or a good number of malicious activity becomes very hard. Um, there is a 
serious lack of user feedback, uh, expert feedback and validation, um, which results in most machine learning algorithms having to rely on statistical scores like F-score, ADI under the curve, and so on, uh, which may or may not mean a whole lot to the security analyst. The interpretability of, interpretability of the machine learning models, again, uh, is, is, is very tricky. And again, one of our goals is to be able to make the models interpretable. Uh, the one way we do it is uh, to be able to, uh, since we have a much lower dimensional subspace where we deal with the outliers, we want to be able to generate an explanation in terms of a com linear combination of the uh, dimensions that are in your lower dimensions as uh, a possible explanation um, to the user. And, and that's much more easier uh, than doing this in a thousand dimensions, for example. And uh, I think the biggest problem is that implicit trust is bad. Uh, people either trust machine learning algorithms or not. Uh, I, I like this quote that says, garbage in and people think gospel out. And the chatbot from Microsoft is the perfect example of this. Uh, people uh, abuse the tweet bot uh, vigorously and within a day it turned out to be this female hating Nazi bot and it had to be taken down. So uh, for the success of machine learning, you need the data to be, uh, your, your algorithms are only going to be as good as the data that you have and uh, uh, you know, trust but verify. So uh, the other problem that we have and a lot of other people have is uh, you know, possibly baking in existing bad behavior when you construct baselines of uh, users and machines. So uh, the takeaways are uh, you know, correlation does not imply causation. Uh, there's a lot of um, um, data correlation algorithms out there, but uh, they don't explain what they do really well. Um, and in general, more data beats a clever algorithm. Uh, and also learn from many, many models. Often, there's no one algorithm to rule them all. So uh, you want to be able to run an ensemble of different uh, models in order to get uh, an effective uh, answer. Uh, so breach detection in general is hard, um, but machine learning should be able to help with um, breach analytics and forensics. And uh, I think that's it for me. Yes, have any questions?